Welcome back, Troglodytes, to the Trogly's Guitar Show. Today, we have a very confusing guitar that apparently just nobody really knows what this thing is, but I think I have solved the case. So let's go ahead and go over this guitar. This is a prehistoric reissue. I knew that from day one. However, this was actually another eBay auctioned guitar. It was sold as a 2000 Gibson R9. I knew this wasn't an R9 just by the specs of this thing. However, I do understand why the seller thought this. They probably called Gibson up. They said, I have a Les Paul with serial number 90017. And they probably just read it like a normal historic serial number. And they probably told them, yeah, that's a 2000 R9. And they took it and sold it with that really have to look at the specs of your guitar to fully understand what you have because certain serial numbers have been used multiple times in different eras of Gibson. The most noticeable feature here is the Gibson logo. This is unmistakably the Gibson prehistoric logo. It kind of looks a little bit goofy. The G's collapsed in on itself. You have the open B and the open O. Honestly, this logo looks a little bit goofy, but you kind of learn to love it because of what these guitars represent. So I watched this auction because I had a feeling it was going to go fairly cheap because I bet a lot of people thought this was a fake Gibson. Strictly because this logo looks a little bit weird compared to modern day Gibsons and you kind of have that outline running around it. And a lot of people probably thought this silk screen was a little bit too high up so that probably scared them away as well. So in the final minutes of this auction, there was just me and this other guy. We were kind of bidding it out. I actually ended up paying more for this guitar than I really wanted to for my purposes anyways because I thought this was a 1989 prehistoric. Because generally, this first digit when it comes to the prehistoric era, since I saw it had the prehistoric logo, this first digit means the year it was made. So this one would read 1989, 17th in production. Now, that could be true. That could be what this serial number means. Again, it could also be a 2000s R9. But little did I know that I was actually incorrect on what this guitar was. Now, I purchased this guitar back in February. I've been really behind on doing these reviews on these guitars. So when I got it, I just checked to make sure there were no hidden brakes, cracks, or repairs. Uh, for the price I ended up getting it for, it's like, well, if the pickups have been changed, it doesn't really matter. So I really never took this guitar apart. So since I know a lot about prehistoric reissues, I decided to do this guitar today because, well, I know a lot. It's easy to ramble on and on and give information that I've pretty much committed to memory. I didn't have to do any additional research. But right before I started filming this, I was like, you know, I probably should make sure that these are the Bill Lawrence, the original pickups and to make sure that everything's original on it. I also noticed that I hadn't cleaned the fretboard up yet. So I got this thing on my workbench, I got the strings off, I cleaned the fretboard, made it look really nice, and I started to take out these pickups. And what I found underneath there blew my mind. I was like, holy crap, somebody put 1983 Tim Shaw's in this guitar. So I was thinking, awesome. The reason why the later era prehistorics aren't quite as valuable one, you're not in the Norlin era anymore, you're in the Jeskowitz era, so they're a little bit less valuable simply because they're not as early as the other ones. And two, because the Tim Shaw's kind of disappeared around 86, 87. So 88 and 89 is the home field for the Bill Lawrence, the original pickups. They're kind of a circuit board pickup, and circuit board pickup might sound bad or scary, but they actually sound pretty good. But when I found 83 Tim Shaw's in here, I was like, wow, that's fantastic. Somebody put excellent pickups, you know, from probably some other prehistoric. But when I got to the back control plate and I took these off, I got very silent. This had 83 pot codes as well, and everything looked untouched. So this made me very curious about this guitar. 
This serial number, once again, it followed the format of what I thought was a 1989. So this thing was a mystery to me. So my next thought process was, okay, maybe there's a date stamp underneath the pots. So I went to take the pots out to see if I could find anything. These things were a pain in the butt to get out. I have never had a set of pots be so difficult. It literally took me an hour to get these things out. Now I was being kind of a dumbo here. I was using the blunt end of my screwdrivers to kind of hammer them out. And while I didn't damage the guitar or anything, it's very prone to getting damaged that way. If you're ever in this situation, here's what actually finally ended up working for this thing. You're gonna wanna grab two screwdrivers you're going to want to have one that kind of has this flat head. Once you have your knobs off, you'll just insert this screwdriver to the pot head. And then you'll take this and kind of use it as like a chisel. Just hit that with the blunt force. And that popped them out. Unfortunately, there was no date stamp under there, which I kind of thought would be the case. But luckily I did that without breaking anything. No real damage had occurred. All I saw in there I think was like an RR signature and a few numbers. I'll throw that up here on the screen. So then I took a second look into these pickup cavities just to see if I missed anything the first time. And I did. I didn't find a date stamp, but I have seen something I have never seen before. This actually has the Made in USA stamp inside the neck pickup cavity. It's very, very, very lightly stamped in there, but I actually missed that on my first run through of this guitar. So that was kind of interesting because you don't have that on the back of your headstock, so I guess they decided to put that in there. So at this point, I was very confused by this guitar. I had thought, well, maybe somebody took 83 Tim Shaws and 83 Potts and took the 89s out and put the 83s in. While that still kind of is a possibility, I don't think that is the case because they would have had to do some new soldering work in order to do that, and I really don't see that those have ever been touched. Another characteristic that is only on like the early 80s prehistorics, similar to like the Heritage 80 series, are these bonnet knobs. They have a very distinctive look to them. They kind of look like little UFOs. They've got a slant and then they've got kind of a skirt to them. They have a little bit of a gold sparkle. They really just have an interesting, distinct look. I can tell the difference between the early 80s ones and any other knob simply because I am a huge fan of these things. This is what the Spotlight Specials came with. These are pretty hard to hunt down if you ever need to restore something with those. So since I no longer believe this was a late 80s Les Paul, I thought, well, is this one of like those Guitar Trader models, like the very early 59 reissues? Because I knew that those ones had leading serial numbers with nine. So I reviewed Slabowski's article about those, and most of those had the very small font on there, and they'll have a traditional serial number stamped right here on the inside wood on the cavity. This one did not have that, so I was just left very confused of what this guitar could be. The early prehistoric logos usually don't get that ring around the Gibson logo, and some of the early ones don't quite have this version of the logo. And then we have a few things like the standard truss rod cover, you've got replaced tuners, and honestly I think there's been a lot of things replaced on this guitar. But I just did a Google search, something along the lines of like 1983 Special Order Gibson, and lo and behold I found another one of these with a very similar top, and this guitar is actually a lot more rare than I thought it was. 1983 is when Gibson finally introduced a Les Paul reissue model. They didn't call it a 60 or a 59, it was just called Les Paul reissue. That is when the serialization that I was talking about earlier came into effect. So a 1983 reissue would have a leading three and then four numbers after it. 
I've actually had one of those before, and I called that the earliest prehistoric I had. Now, I actually owned this guitar at the same time of filming that video, and I didn't realize that there was a very small run of guitars right before the first reissues, and they had the correct 59 styled serial number in this font. So this is a 1983 Les Paul reissue before the prehistorics like officially came out. So this is like a dinosaur before the dinosaurs. So it's a pre prehistoric <laughs> if we get a little bit crazy with the names. So this guitar went from kind of a meh 1989 prehistoric standard. They're cool, but they just don't quite command as much. And now it became my absolute favorite year for Gibson, 1983. So much cool stuff was happening then. And this was one of the earliest reissue Les Pauls being called a reissue. Now this thing doesn't predate like the Leo's Les Pauls and the strings and things. Those all came before that too. But this is the first when they were finally being called reissues. Now I was very interested to find out that there's actually a famous user of this run of guitars. And that's Mark Knopfler of Dire Straits. The guy that sings all those great songs, plays all those great licks. He actually owned and used one from this run of guitars for the Money For Nothing album. Now his serial number for his guitar is 90006, and this one's 90017. So 11 guitars away from Mark's guitar. Now his has been modified quite extensively. And then there was that other one I found on Reverb that was for sale. These all seem to have similar tops to them. Now this guitar photographs terribly. Like usually it'll look like this. It doesn't look like it has a great top, but when you get it at the right angle, wow. This thing has a really wide flame to it. And honestly, I prefer a flame top like this. I really don't like the pinstripey flame when there's just so much of it on there because generally it doesn't move as much. These kinds of tops are very dramatic depending on the angle you're at. The flames just burst to life. I mean, this is my kind of flame top right here. I just wish they would photograph better, but in person, holy cow. This is a nice looking Les Paul reissue. This guitar really threw me for a loop. The seller thought it was an R9. I thought it was an 89 prehistoric. It turns out everybody was wrong. It's a 1983 pre-reissue prehistoric Les Paul. And there's even a famous user for this run of guitars. So now that we've kind of uncovered the mystery behind this one, let's go ahead and hear how this guitar sounds. This guitar weighs 9 pounds, 8.8 .8 ounces, and features a 60s neck profile. 
Now that we know how this one sounds, let's go ahead and look at its condition. Now despite this guitar being a very rare guitar, I don't think whoever owned this guitar ever knew that. Judging how it ended up on eBay to like a pawn shop or something, this guitar was played heavily throughout its life. It has many changed parts, so while this is an incredibly collectible guitar, it's not gonna be incredibly expensive because, well, it's pretty well worn and has a lot of changed parts on it. So the face of your headstock, once again, you can see it's got lots of scratches here from string changes, and you kind of have some lacquer wear along the edges of the headstock veneer. Overall, it's pretty average wear to see on a guitar that has been played as much as this one, but it does have a very well-worn vibe to it. That outline happens due to how Gibson does their inlays. That's kind of how you know it's a real Gibson, unfortunately. That's ever present on modern day guitars. The truss rod cover has been replaced. It would have originally been blank and you have replaced Schaller tuners. The truss rod functions just fine. Your frets do show some considerable wear. There's some flattening areas. I would say a level recrown job would definitely do this guitar wonders, but you don't necessarily need to do it right away. I think it still plays just fine. The frets are rather low, but I would say they have at least one level recrown job left in them before having to be replaced. The rosewood fretboard is in great shape as well. I just cleaned and oiled this thing today, so it really is a nice playing guitar. You have your typical binding crack lines along the frets. Due to the wood expanding and contracting in different temperatures, the frets don't because they're metal, so that's how those happen. You'll find that on pretty much every Gibson that's older than a few years. The flame top on this thing is just phenomenal. I really do like this example. I wish it kind of always looked like this at every angle though. But there is this kind of dead angle right here where it just has a little bit of figuring to it before it really just smash you in the face. But once you get this thing in the light, you can see there are quite a few nicks, dings, and scratches on this guitar. It definitely has been well played throughout its entire life. Nobody really cared about what this guitar was, and quite frankly, I don't think they knew what it was. All they knew is that it was a fantastic player, and they wanted to play it. And you know, I'm kind of happy for this guitar that it didn't spend its life in a collector's collection just collecting dust. There's nothing wrong with playing your guitars, and there's also nothing wrong with collecting them. I think it's just interesting to see all the different stories and backgrounds that each guitar has. I think that's kind of what makes my channel fun, is we get to see examples of both walks of life. So you've got some light edge wear here and just your average light nicks and dings in general, especially down here kind of where your strap would be. But for the most part, I would say the top is clean. I didn't do any type of polishing to this guitar. What you see is just honest play wear. Now right here, there is some chipping to the clear coat. It kind of looks a little bit ugly in person, but you could touch it up, but I think you'd just be best to leave it as is. The pickguard is a nice dark aged color. I'm thinking these pickup rings might have been replaced, but I could be wrong on that. It's just, they almost feel like historic spec parts. So I really do think somebody who owned this guitar tried to make it look more like an R9 by giving it these like upgraded plastics and putting on the brown back plates. You have your two Tim Shaw PAFs that date to 1983 your non-wire ABR1 bridge, and your tailpiece, and these are all nickel hardware. Back of the headstock, again, your serial number is 90017. So that makes this the 17th reissue made before they did the reissue line. Now, I'm not sure how many were in this run. I would guess not that many. Because whenever one of these do show up, they usually have a very low serial number, so it's probably less than 50, probably even less than 25. But, but I have no information to verify that, that's just some general conjecture from what I've seen listed. You have era correct Schallers on here, but these are not the original tuners. Again, you can see the small holes on top and on bottom. 
It doesn't appear that they were filled in, so if you were to put a Klusen style tuner on here, the only holes that you would actually see are left over from the Schallers. Now as far as the condition goes here, you just kind of have some light scratches, you're in pretty good shape, and you have some edge wear. There are no brakes, cracks, or repairs. However, you do have some finish checking in this area, and you kind of have some dirt build up here. You'll see that in the black light test too, but everything's good on here. Uh, the only small area where there's kind of a little bit of worn finish is right here. We'll also see that later in the black light test. Now I would say this has a 60s neck profile. You don't have any major gouges, but you have some light impression marks. The back of the guitar does have some buckle worming marks, mainly towards the center. I mean, this thing could be in a lot worse condition than it is. However, it really has held up pretty well over the years. We just have quite a few replaced parts on this thing. Really, the only thing that I think are original are the pickups, electronics, and the husk of the guitar itself. The hardware and the plastics are also original. So on the back, your biggest areas of concern are right here. There's kind of a large ding, and then a few dings in this area as well. For the most part, I think it displays pretty good. Again, you have your thin binding in the cutaway, which means you can see the maple top right there. And you just have some light wear and tear along the edges here. You do have Dunlop strap locks, but you do not have the counterparts to those. I've never personally liked the Dunlop strap locks. I think they stick out too far and it always scares me when I see an SG have these because these things are like giant chisels sticking out at the back of your neck just waiting to separate your neck. Now you don't have to worry about that too much on a Les Paul, but I don't know, that's just my own personal beef. I kind of like the Schallers better, but I do like the idea of that little button. I think the Dunlops are easier to get on and off. So overall, this guitar has definitely been played. You got replaced tuners, replaced truss rod cover, replaced back plates, replaced jack plate, but you know, the core parts that you need on this guitar are there. And that's the beautiful husk of this guitar and the awesome Tim Shaw PAFs. Now we'll take a look at this guitar under black light. You can see you've got a little bit of clear coat wear in this area, as well as where the sweat of somebody's arm has kind of absorbed into the finish. But other than that, the top is looking correct. You've got a super glowing pick guard and poker chip. I mean, you can see these things have definitely got some age to them. That's the other reason why I think these pickup rings might have been replaced. They don't quite glow the same. Back of the guitar, once again, glows the way I would expect it to. You can see these areas where it glows more. Once again, that's because where your sweat has kind of <laughs> absorbed into the finish. Back of the neck, everything's looking good here. Again, it's a darker green color here, once again, because of the sweat. And here you can see that area of clear coat where I was talking about earlier. There's a few spots where the clear coat has kind of worn off the neck. Back of the headstock is also glowing the way I would expect it to. There are no brakes, cracks, or repairs to this guitar. So this one definitely passes the black light test. This guitar comes in an era correct Gibson Generation 3 chainsaw case. I'm guessing the store likely gave it this case. Even though most of these came in like a Lifton styled reissue, it's possible this isn't even the original case. This case is in pretty good shape. You've got a little bit of wear to the Gibson logo, but for the most part, it functions just fine. You only have two of the metal latches attached. The back one is broken off. However, it is inside of the case. The interior is a very nice brown color. I think the brown Gen 3 chainsaw cases are my favorite. I kind of prefer them over the blue, but a lot of it comes down to what color your guitar is, if it goes with the finish very well or not. Here's the broken latch in there. If you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this very rare pre-reissue 1983 Les Paul prehistoric reissue, feel free to contact me on my Facebook page, facebook.com slash troglies, T-R-O-G-L-Y-S. Thank you, Troll Dice, for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.